Welcome to the third event in our Rosalind Franklin Centennial Series and fourth event of the year honoring women in science and healthcare. My name is Lise Elliott and I'm a neuroscience professor and executive chair of the Foundational Sciences and Humanities Department in Chicago Medical School. On behalf of our hardworking organizing committee, I thank you for joining us and helping us to honor Rosalind Franklin's important scientific contributions and legacy for the advancement of women in STEM and healthcare. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Esther Chu, who's professor in the Center for Policy and Research in Emergency Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. I first invited Dr. Chu to speak at Rosalind Franklin nearly two years ago as we were organizing our third annual WISH Symposium on the topic of sexual harassment in science and healthcare. Dr. Chu has written powerfully about the problem and its solutions and was a founding member of Time's Up Healthcare, an advocacy initiative aimed at ending sexual harassment across the healthcare workforce. Dr. Chu was not able to join us in 2019, but happily is able to be with us today in this 100th year anniversary of Dr. Franklin's birth. But it's not quite this celebratory year we imagined on top of the COVID pandemic the Black Lives Matter movement opened our eyes to the depth and breadth of racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. And this happens to be another major focus of Dr. Chu's impactful work, which we're looking forward to hearing about tonight. Dr. Chu graduated from Yale University with a bachelor's degree in English literature, a fitting start for someone who's become such an effective communicator about healthcare. She went on to receive her MD at Yale University and completed her residency in emergency medicine at Boston Medical Center. She then moved to Oregon, where she did a fellowship in health services research and earned an MPH in epidemiology and biostats at OHSU, where she remains today. Dr. Chu is, a board is board certified in emergency medicine and continues to practice while also teaching, directing a fellowship, and spending the bulk of her time on research addressing drug policy, injury, and health injury and health inequities. She has six active grants, including three from the NIH, and is widely published with 88 peer-reviewed articles and many other book chapters, commentaries, popular media pieces, and even a regular column in The Lancet focused on health disparities. The breadth of topics she writes about is truly remarkable, and not surprisingly, she's amassed a huge Twitter following, including me, of people who enjoy learning about her insights. Dr. Chu is a highly sought speaker and has regular appearances on MSNBC and CNN discussing frontline healthcare issues during this COVID-19 crisis. So we're especially fortunate to have her with us tonight. Uh, so as Dr. Chu presents her talk, please use the Q&A box to enter your questions um, or endorse the questions of others, and we'll get to those in the last 10 or 15 minutes or so. So without further ado, I, will, I welcome Dr. Chu and uh, invite her to share her PowerPoint. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming to this evening's event. And I just appreciate the organizers of the event for inviting me to this. Um, I do speak a lot, but when, I'm, when I am invited to speak to something like this, um, at an occasion like this, uh, especially knowing so well Rosalind Franklin's legacy and the history of your institution, it feels very special um, and really like an honor. So thank you for joining me. Um, I just have one conflict of interest. I am the founder of a company called Equity Quotient, and this is the last time I will mention it in this talk. These are objectives for this evening. I wanted to start by discussing why equity is so important for the healthcare workforce. We'll talk about several key challenges in improving inclusion and equity in medicine, and I'll introduce some effective strategies and approaches in the effort to create a, a greater culture of equity within our health and science organizations. I am gonna start by talking about uh, what is hard to ignore, which is the pandemic that we're in the middle of. Um, I actually, when I got this invitation, I was so relieved to talk about something other than COVID. But I, I think when we talk about the importance of equity in science and in healthcare, uh, it is hard not to think about 
what has unfurled in front of us during this pandemic, because uh, I think at the very beginning, anybody who has studied pandemics understood that there would be an unequal effect of the pandemic across racial and ethnic groups, because that is the rule of pandemics. But I think what has surprised us um, is how the inequities have really become the defining feature of this pandemic and something that we've almost felt powerless to stop as it played out. And every time we have a piece of data, about inequities uh, across racial and ethnic lines, it is worse than, than it seemed before. Uh, and I think this title catches that very well. Um, just a couple of examples of how big these disparities are. Um, this is data from the CDC examining death rates by age and by race. And of course, we know that age is a major determining factor in your outcomes in COVID. Um, but that disparity is different when uh, across racial uh, populations. And so, you know, this is from the Brookings Institute. Basically, no matter what age category you're in, Black people are dying from COVID at roughly the same rate as white people more than a decade older. And, um, and age-specific death rates for Hispanic and Latino people fall in between white people and black people. And so we're always talking about this weathering effect of racism, this aging effect, and we're seeing it in this pandemic. We are seeing it consistently um, across uh, across racial and ethnic minorities. Um, so if you look at this, it takes a little bit of time to unpack. This is from the APM Research Lab, which has done a wonderful job looking at some of these health disparities. But you can see um, the, you know, the bottom line is Asian Americans. The, um, the blue line just above that is white Americans. And then you can see the other lines that are uh, first Pacific Islanders in the solid blue line. The, uh, the gray line with the triangles is the Latino population. And then you can see indigenous in the yellow and, um, and black Americans uh, in the green triangle up top as, like, as the highest death tolls uh, per 100,000. When we talk about why this is, I mean, people have said from the beginning, well, it's because of the way that chronic disease uh, is distributed across the population. And that is part of it. But I think what the way that we think of health equity is we think of the entire continuum of your life and all the different uh, ways that disadvantage plays out. Um, and of course, you can look at any group. You can look at uh, groups defined by race, ethnicity, sex or gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, your religion, your country of origin, your language, your age, whatever, your disability. Um, but, um, but no matter what it is, uh, we have sort of started, we started out in this pandemic with a lot of differences in social disadvantage. And those differences have led to differences already, differences in health and health outcomes from the outset. And then we entered into this pandemic and if you think of things that lead to disparities in how exposed you are to the virus and your susceptibility to contracting disease in your ability to access timely care, um, the way that we diagnose and treat you and then disparities in our developing evidence base, every single one of those factors plays a role in differential um, disease and care in COVID. Um, and I know this is a complex slide, but if you start in the top left, you think about who has the essential workforce roles? Who gets to work from home in their jobs? Who uses public transportation? Who are the sole wage earners in their family so they can't afford to take time out even when they do get sick? Who has sick leave? Who lives in crowded or multi-generational housing? Um, who, when they do access care, has to travel further and they have crowded medical facilities? And so even those resources are not safe to go to necessarily. And then who's in the face-to-face -face caregiving roles in their families so that they are, again, even in their safety of their own home, are more exposed to COVID? And then you go to the top right. Um, and we think about the burden of chronic diseases, particularly the diseases that have turned out to be determining factors in COVID in terms of who develops severe disease and is at higher risk for mortality. If you go to the bottom left, um, these are disparities in accessing care and receiving timely diagnosis and treatment. And then it has to do with the neighborhoods where you live, uh, what kind of health center capacity is there, who has insurance and sufficient insurance, who has, um, the healthcare uh, establishment earned trust with which populations? Uh, who has logistical obstacles to getting to healthcare? Um, some of those feed back into the type of jobs you have and how much leeway you have to take time off. And then who, even when they finally make connection with healthcare, um, experiences the structural and individual biases and the discrimination in care um, and in prevention of disease. Um, again, very disparate by things like race, ethnicity, and gender. 
And then finally, something we don't think about a lot is who really benefits from advances in knowledge? And of course, the speed of knowledge has been tremendous in this pandemic. Never seen anything like it, but there are clear disparities in who is included in our observational studies, who's enrolled in our clinical trials. And what that means is that we have systematically excluded some populations from our developing knowledge base and therefore from reliable data about how they will fare with certain treatments um, and their ability to access best practice care that fits them. And so you take all of these things, the, the disparities across all these domains, and these have additive or sometimes multiplicative effects. And that in sum is what leads to unequal rates of illness and death. And I guess what I would say is I'm gonna give you some ex specific examples of how this plays out in COVID, but this is true really in any disease process, any, any health outcome. It's just that the COVID example is one that's particularly, I would say, on steroids in terms of our ability to look at it, it happening in real time. So let's just take women, for example. Um, women have really come forward as the front lines of uh, of the workforce during this pandemic period. So two thirds of caregivers in the US are women, meaning they provide the daily or regular support to children, adults, or people with chronic illnesses or disabilities. And women who are caregivers in general have a greater risk for poor physical and mental health, including depression and anxiety. And that means in this time, women have taken on a tremendous burden. Of course, they're the source of daily or regular support to children who are largely home now and away from school, um, either continuously or for periods of time. And as, um, as people fall ill, they are bearing the burden of caring for those sick uh, loved ones at home. Um, something you've probably noticed just when you go out on your essential errands, um, greater than two thirds of workers at grocery store checkouts, fast food counters are women. Um, and if you've had any contact with healthcare, about 80% of the healthcare workforce is women. It's uh, not what you see if you're just looking at the leadership board, that tends to be less than 20%. But the people um, in the roll your sleeves up kind of work in hospitals everywhere are largely women and therefore they are really taking on the risk of exposure in healthcare settings. Women are really taking a hit in terms of, uh, of their livelihoods and their wealth over this time period. And I think as delayed as our timelines were for achieving uh, income and job equity, I think the pandemic is going to set us back probably by decades. Um, and if you look at these charts, look at the one to the left, if you look across industries, um, at where the job losses have been, um, it, it really has systematically hit women much harder in pretty much every type of industry. So women are up front in the high risk roles, um, and yet they are suffering more when it comes to unemployment. There are intersectional effects, and I always want to be really clear that we should keep an eye out for the intersectional effects. It's not just about gender. It's not just about race. It's not just about disability. Um, when you put any of these factors together, there tends to be a compounded effect. And we are seeing this just as one example. If you look at employment um, and you can look at the statistics the statistics for white workers, for, Latino, for Latinx workers. And then if you combine gender and ethnicity here, you'll see the hardest hit. Um, in terms of skyrocketing unemployment has been among Latinx women. Just pausing in case you wanna absorb this data, but I will also make slides available um, since I'm throwing a lot of data rich uh, data, uh, slides at you. I wanna walk you through a kind of narrative that I've seen in healthcare specifically so that you can see again, how these uh, vulnerabilities or disparities are compounding. So this is an example from a very, uh, one of the big early studies on uh, patients with COVID presenting to a large healthcare system. This was out of Sutter Health in California. And one thing they looked at was, if you ultimately are diagnosed with COVID-19, where did you receive your tests? And you can see um, the one that I have a box around is that if you were a Black American in the study, if you were Afri defined as African American, um, only 30% of people got their testing in an ambulatory care setting. Compare that to the Asian patients in the study or the white patients in the study to the left of them. So 60% of Asian patients who ultimately had COVID were tested early in the outpatient or ambulatory care setting. What this told me was that if you were an African-American patient in this study, um, you had to be sick to get tested. You had to need to go to the emergency department or in some cases, get hospitalized before you got your COVID-19 test. 
you are half as likely to get it in the outpatient setting. So why is that important? Um, it's important because early identification of disease means everything in the management and treatment of COVID. Here's just one example. If you look at treatment criteria for remdesivir, which has been uh, in short supply across the country, even after it got emergency authorization use, remdesivir required a confirmed PCR test and a confirmed PCR test that was done early um, within the first 10 days of, uh, of your symptoms. And so if you had delayed diagnoses, you were less likely to get one of the treatments we have available. And is that, so what happens more on a, if we look across uh, large groups of patients? Um, here's a study of cancer patients who developed COVID-19 and how they were treated. And what happened was black patients in the study were about half as likely to receive remdesivir as white patients. And I thought that alignment with the testing data from the other study with almost exact concordance of being half as likely to receive that remdesivir was likely a consistent narrative. If you're not getting tested, you're not getting treated, and that translates to a ton of different management decisions. I want to be clear that the way that these that these um, these disparities work out, these inequities, is not just on an individual level. So it's it's not always coming down to that individual's decision to test or not test or to treat or not treat. There are always a lot of structural factors that make it hard to do right, even if you're trying very hard not to be biased or discriminatory at the bedside. So again, when remdesivir, this medication in short supply was shipped out to hospitals everywhere, the distribution of it was very uneven and it was hard to understand actually who was getting it and who wasn't. But one thing that was really observed was that um, often major hospitals were left out, including safety net hospitals, which had a higher proportion of, of racial and ethnic minorities. In Boston, for example, um, Mass General said they got it when they hadn't even asked for the drug. And yet Boston Medical Center, which is the safety net hospital in South Boston, was left out of that supply, which um, systematically excluded Black patients from receiving it. I want to give an example of exclusion from science. This was the first phase one Moderna study that came out, published in the New England Journal. Um, and just look at this enrollment table. I often put a big box or circle around uh, the thing that is striking, but there are so many zeros here um, under racial and ethnic groups that I thought no emphasis needed. <laughs> you can just look across all those zeros and ask what is happening, particularly with the data that I showed you about who is hit hardest in this pandemic and how discrepant it is from the way that enrollment happened. It's almost systematic exclusion of the people most affected by the pandemic. And the disturbing thing about this, which many of you probably know, is that phase one trials tend to be the most inclusive. There's smaller studies, you have a lot of control about who you recruit in. They're often very um, thoughtful about representation and enrollment. So if we're starting out here in phase one trials, um, it's very concerning about what will happen by phase three. Um, fortunately, as you know, um, Moderna got a lot of heat about this and they were the pharmaceutical company that really stood up and said they were not going to release their results unless they had met their target enrollment in terms of racial and ethnic diversity. So there was, a pretty quick response to this for once. But across clinical trials, across diseases, we see this pattern again and again. We are systematically excluding um, a diverse population from, uh, from participation in science that has huge implications when it comes to, um, to actual treatment. So, you know, I, I bring this up again just to, uh, just to emphasize that when we think about how disparities and then health inequities um, play out, there's never a simple or easy answer. And you will hear um, this in discussion all the time. It's because of this, it's because of that. Um, people tend to think that it's just about age and chronic disease, and that's the way that we present it. But really, it is. Um, it has so much to do with almost every policy out there. I mean, it has to do with housing policy. It has to do with criminal justice policy. It has to do with environmental policy. It has to do with the way that we plan cities and that we provide transportation, the way that health centers have been closing um, in, in rural and hard to reach and high needs populations for the past decade and at dramatic rates. And so um, there's no simple answer. And it also means that the solutions are not incredibly simple either. And so what is the ultimate goal when I tell you about this huge challenge that we face? 
And I, I love this definition. Actually, um, people define equity in many different ways, um, but this, this definition really hit home for me. Racial equity is the condition that would be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicted in a statistical sense how one fares. And I, um, I tried to unpack that a little bit and make it healthcare relevant. And this is the way that I think about it in a sort of day-to-day -day way that I might use it. So I think of it as equity is when one race does not predict how confident you are when you walk into the doors of our hospital that you or your loved one will be respected, cherished, and cared for to the very best of our ability. Um, and of course, I'm focusing on race here, but I want to be clear that um, that goes for a whole range of um, identities and characteristics, including the things that I've listed before, but certainly not limited to them. So what are our solutions? Um, and I, I want to talk about one part of it. And again, I have said that this is a complex problem and that we're not going to just be able to find you know, the magic bullet with one or two things um, in identifying the underlying factors that really lead to, um, to health equity. But one part that really interests me is how powerful it is to have some level of provider concordance in the healthcare workforce. And I'll give you two examples of really how important this can be um, that has implications for, you know, for training our workforce. So one is this study out of Oakland. I don't know if you've seen this, but um, this has uh, appeared in the economics literature, actually, rather than the health literature. And so it was missed, I think, by some of my peers. This is a study where they recruited men from barbershops in Oakland, black men, and they brought them to a clinic and they randomized them to either a white doctor or a black doctor. And what they found was that if you were randomized to a black doctor, so if you had a racially concordant doctor in the study, you were more likely to receive blood pressure and BMI measurement, agree to diabetes and cholesterol screening, and accept the flu shot. So all just you know these kind of core uh, uh, preventive health measures that are so important to your long-term health. And uh, being econo uh, economists, they extrapolated out and they estimated that there would be a reduction in cardiovascular mortality by about 16 deaths per 100,000 per year, which would lead to a 19% reduction in this very tenacious black-white male gap in cardiovascular mortality over time. And I'll say, um, before I move on, I will say, when you look at studies that, that, uh, that examine patient provider concordance, often the outcome is how you feel. So there's a million studies about when you saw a doctor who was kind of like you, did you feel like they listened to you more or less? Um, did you feel good in that room? Did you feel comfortable? Did you feel understood? This is part of a growing body of studies where the question isn't how happy were you with your care? It was literally, how did it affect your survival? Um, that is how important we think things like concordance are. Here's one looking at gender concordance. This is out of a large uh, data set of visits to hospitals across the state of Florida. And in this case, they looked at what happened if you were a woman having a heart attack and you went into the emergency department and you encountered either a male or a female physician in the emergency room who was taking care of you. Um, and you know it's kind of a quasi-randomized study because you're not gonna call ahead and request the woman on or the man on, you're just, you get who you get. Um, and this is what they found. Um, so they looked at if it was a male provider treating a female patient, um, a male provider treating a male patient or a female provider treating a female patient. And again, the outcome here is survival from your heart attack. And they found that when women received care from women doctors, they had higher likelihood of survival from their heart attack. So again, there seemed to be a powerful gender concordance effect on your well-being, on, in the, on your health, in this case, um, on, your, on your actual uh, likelihood of, of living through this heart attack. But then the authors did something else that I thought was much more interesting. They actually looked at the gender diversity within the entire department to which somebody presented. Um, and they found that when female patients went to emergency departments that had a higher percentage of female physicians, they experienced better outcomes, even if they were treating treated by a male physician. In fact, that relationship was particularly true for patients treated by a male physician, that their, their survival improved um, drastically if that male physician was practicing in a group that had more gender diversity. And I think this is actually the point of it. It's not that we need to make all of healthcare and science super matchy-matchy. 
you know, my goal is not to go and find, you know, an Asian female from the Midwest to treat me all the time. I think more it's about something that we know, which is that when you have diversity, the collective intelligence and performance of your group improves. So there's there's a high stake for everybody in making sure that our profession is, is as inclusive, as representative of the communities that we serve um, for a number of reasons, but I think it's really to improve everyone. So are we achieving that? And I think it's really clear that we are not. Um, so this is a snapshot of the uh, percentage of active physicians in the United States as of 2018 broken down by race and ethnicity. What you see in these black boxes is the percentage of uh, that group within our general U.S. population. Um, and you can see, you know, compared to the general population, um, uh, we have underrepresentation of of black physicians, underrepresentation of Hispanic physicians, and then an overrepresentation, actually a vast overrepresentation of Asian physicians. And that's actually more striking uh, when you go into academic settings. Are we improving on these measures? And I will say people have this gut sense that we're getting better in terms of representation that we must be because I don't know, we're evolving over time as people and we're understanding the value of diversity and there's so many diversity initiatives, we must be getting better. But actually we're really not. If you look at this graph, um, the top line is, um, this is just among women, but it's very similar for men. This is for US medical school faculty. The top line is, um, is white female faculty. And you see that number seems to be declining over time over the past decade. So that sounds like maybe good news because it means there's more of other things. Um, but if you look at the orange line that seems to be going up in about the same proportion, those are Asian physician faculty. Um, and I've already told you that they're overrepresented. Um, if you think that a, a decent standard is their, um, their uh, representation in the general US population. And then you look at every other group on the bottom. Uh, and those lines look really flat. And indeed, they are completely flat. We're not really doing much in terms of recruitment of minoritized faculty in, um, in medicine. And so why is that the case? Um, because if you're like me, you feel like every other week there's a new diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging initiative. Um, there's, the words keep on adding on and yet we're not achieving very much. Um, and I will tell you a few things that I think are influential factors. And I think one is that we don't have a culture that makes everybody feel like they can prosper here. Um, this is a survey of graduating U.S. medical students, a lot of them, more than 27,000 of them. Uh, and what they found was, uh, and they asked these students about general negative behaviors, including explicit sexual harassment, and, and also behaviors consistent with discrimination based on their gender, race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. And they found that overall mistreatment was very common, especially among women medical students, um, Asian minoritized students, multiracial students, and lesbian, gay, and bisexual students. 28% of female students reported discrimination based on their gender, 16% um, of Asians, 23% of minoritized students, and 12% of multiracial students reported discrimination based on their race and ethnicity, and 23% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual students reported a higher prevalence of discrimination based on sexual orientation. What about in residency? Um, study from the surgical literature where um, this time they, uh, they surveyed more than 7,000 residents in surgical uh, training. Uh, and again, I won't read all these numbers to you, but you can look at, um, at the percentage experiencing gender discrimination, overall 31% for women at 65%. Then go down to racial discrimination experienced overall by almost 17%. Any abuse, verbal, emotional, or physical, 30%, sexual harassment by 10%. And I think, uh, I don't know what your expectations are, but sometimes people look at this and they're like, oh, it's surgery residency, of course. I don't know what your expectations are, but I, I think there's no universe in, this is, in which this is what we plan or hope for, for our medical students in the previous study or for our surgical residents. Um, and in particular, the gendered and the racial abuses, I think are, um, are quite disturbing in the 21st century. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, this is a report that came out in 2018 
from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Um, it is a comprehensive review of sexual harassment of women in these settings, um, and it talks about not only the sequelae of sexual harassment, how it plays out in people's careers, but also the um, the origins, the, the risk factors, the characteristics of organizations that have high rates of sexual harassment. It is, um, I actually think it's a riveting read. If you have time and interest, um, it's worth downloading. It's free um, by the National Academies. And uh, I will say I read the entire thing in one setting, uh, in one sitting, and it, it is um, something that really changed my view of my role in academic settings, because I, I felt like all of us have to stand up and speak up about these things and try to move the needle in terms of what we're bringing our trainees into. Um, but just to summarize very quickly the key findings, um, they found that sexual harassment is highly prevalent across the sciences. It is the worst in medicine for a number of reasons. There are clear intersectional effects. So women of color, sexual and gender minorities experience even more harassment, although there's a ton of it to begin with. Uh, again, people seem to have the feeling that, that things are improving over time, but I'll tell you um, over the 30 years or so of literature reviewed here, there's no evidence that there's change over time. And in fact, it seems like we systematically overlook and tolerate sexual harassment uh, across these scientific settings. We undermeasure the problem, and when we do measure it, we measure it poorly, not using evidence-based and validated instruments. And we are, in general, as institutions, stalled at legal compliance, meaning, meaning that we try very hard not to get sued, and that's about it, which is a miserable threshold. The sequelae include um, undermining women's educational and professional attainment, negative effects on mental and physical health, withdrawal from leadership roles from institutions and from scientific fields altogether. Um, and they found that harassment actually has a stronger relationship with women's workplace well-being than any other job stressors. The key thing for me is that um, this report found that the negative effects of harassment extend to witnesses, working groups, and entire organizations. And I think this is true no matter what type of mistreatment you're talking about, whether it's gendered harassment um, or racialized harassment or any other type of discrimination and bigotry. It is not that we need to fix it for those people. Of course, we need to fix it for any groups that are experiencing it. But what we have to understand is that when harassment or discrimination happens, it is a poison to the entire institution. There's no one who is not affected negatively by the presence of these behaviors. So why do we have these cultures? What is the deal? How did we get here? And, and I wanna be clear that the culture of discrimination and of harassment is one of fundamental inequity. If you do not have hierarchies and uh, disparities on a number of factors built into your culture, you simply do not have harassment or abuses. Um, but we have cultures, um, and I'll give, you, I'll give you medicine as an example, but this is true across the sciences, we have cultures that, uh, that systematically are inequitable. Um, this is some data that really focuses on the gender aspect. So this is um, uh, looking at physician salaries across US public medical schools. And people always think they have the answer to why there are reasonable physician salary differences. You know, they talk about years of, you know, that you put in or your specialty choice or your level of funding or your productivity. This study really corrected for almost everything. I mean, it, it, it put in um, proxies for your clinical productivity, for your research productivity, for where you trained and all kinds of things that might explain why you might make more than somebody else who looks equal. And what they found overall was there was an unexplained $20,000 difference in salary. Um, so the male salaries are to the left in the darker color. And you can see that there's this kind of spread across the continuum where the women's salaries on the right are clustered at the lower end of, um, of the scale. That's academics. Um, we find the same thing in private practice. Doc Simity looked across 44,000 uh, full-time physicians. I have full-time in quotes there because it's they define full-time as 40 hours a week. And I don't know a lot of physicians who, who consider 40 hours full-time. But anyway, that's how they defined it. And they found that across specialties, female physicians are 28% less than male physicians. Um, that difference was 25% last year, so it's grown. And I will tell you, um, the pandemic is an amplifier of inequity. So uh, for sure, in the upcoming years, this will be um, a wider discrepancy. Um, and they did adjust, I think, fairly thoughtfully for hours, uh, provider specialty and things like that. And I also want to be clear that when we talk about inequities, 
somebody always will say, well, we just got to get more women in and these things will fix themselves. Um, they think it's just a headcount issue. And I will say um, across medical specialties, even fields like OB-GYN where women dominate and have dominated for a long time, uh, men still make more than women do on average. In fact, there's not a single specialty in medicine in which women earn more than men. And if you need further proof of that concept, just look at nursing. Um, nurses uh, make up 80% or more, uh, sorry, women make up 80% or more of nurses, um, and yet uh, men systematically make more than women in nursing. Once again, uh, let's never forget the intersectional effects. This is a study looking at incomes of physicians by race and sex or gender. Um, and uh, probably not surprising, but you know, the red line at the top is white men. The next line in terms of income is black men. Then you see white women and at the very bottom is black women. Uh, and there is no doubt that whatever metric you're looking at, um, when you combine the effect of race and of gender, um, you see that it is, it is often additive. The same goes for rank. I won't belabor the point, but again, whether it's rank, promotion, leadership roles, money, whatever metric, I would say all the coins of the realm, um, those things are discrepant based on gender and by race. And we see this in academic rank as well. And we see it in leadership roles like, um, like chairs and deans. And you know, it is so obvious and it's so consistent. There are many funny ways you can frame it, um, but, but this is one that I loved. Um, this was a healthcare conference put on by JP Morgan and somebody observed that there were more men named Michael, just the name Michael, um, compared to uh, all of the women CEOs together presenting at this conference. And so again, remember it matters on so many counts. Uh, you know, it's not just about being fair to women or to people of color or to women people of color. Um, it's about the healthcare that we provide. It's about the science that we create. And it's actually about using people to the best of their potential. I love this quote from Michelle Williams at the Emmys last year. Um, she told the story of just being respected and valued and listened to on a set in a way that she had never been before. And she said, when you put value into a person, it empowers that person. And then where do they put that value? They put it into their work. And I firmly believe that when we build cultures where women, where people of color feel fully valued and respected as people, they are empowered and they will make the science and the medicine that we do better. It is an investment in our fields, in our industries, in the output, in the work that we do. So I've told you a lot of bad news. I'm sorry about that. And I, I wanna end where we should, which is on solution building and building a better future. So let's talk about how we address some of these issues and, and the whole thing, you know, how do we address our cultures um, so that they are more receptive to the types of diverse and representative uh, workforce that we really would like to recruit and retain in our specialties so that we can provide the best healthcare, the best science possible um, for, the, for the betterment of everybody. Um, and of course, the answer to these complex problems that I've presented are very complex in themselves. And it is hard to be comprehensive and definitive in a one hour talk. So I like to pick out just a few things that people can carry with them. Um, and so for this talk, I picked out five things. And these don't have to be your five things. You can pick a different five things. But I think it's important to identify a kind of discrete list of things that an organization or an individual will really focus on and try to cultivate just so that we can make progress and not feel overwhelmed. So these are five that I thought um, I could mention to you and I'm happy to hear of other things. But I think the first thing is to implement comprehensive equity operational guidelines. We tend to be kind of scattershot with our equity efforts. Like we'll do a mentorship program over here and we'll do implicit bias training over here. And there's no, really no rhyme or reason to it. We just kind of look around and find convenient things. Um, and really inequity is in everything. And so, so should our actions and our, um, our vision be. So um, something I've been working on recently is, is comprehensive uh, equity operational guidelines. And I'll give you an example of that. I think the second thing is to reject some leadership conventions. I wanna make equity everybody's role. We need to measure and track everything. 
really everything. And I think routinized conversations about inequities. So let me just get into the weeds of those just for a few minutes. Um, when we think about equity, I think it's important to be extremely systematic um, and, and specific. And I think when you march through all the activities of your organization, and when I say organization, I mean like whatever is within your domain. So for me, my primary domain of influence is the research center where I spend most of my time. Um, and so we, as a center, march through all of these things that we do, really all of our activities when it comes to our general culture, how we recruit and hire, the way that we provide mentorship, the kind of research we do, and the way that we think of our research, the way that we build health equity into everything that we do. Um, the small piece of what we do that's outward facing that has to do with engaging with the community, um, even the vendors we use when we purchase lunch, um, we started to rethink every single one. And as we went through and identified our values, we attached them to goals and we attached the goals to metrics so that over a year or two, we can see our progress across all these domains. We can hold each other accountable for them. And when things aren't working, we know it for sure. And we can reassess our approaches and redesign them until we are effective and see positive outcomes. So this is uh, just the first page of our equity operating principles. And the first thing we did was we defined our beliefs and values and we um, laid out explicit definitions for words that we were not comfortable using, we found. Um, we had an entire website where we talked about our mission, vision and values, but we didn't use the words anti-racism or racism or sexism, and now we have. Um, and uh, there's our website, which is fairly static from day to day, but behind it, we have a living document where we're constantly challenging ourselves to be more explicit it with what it is that we are taking on when we talk about equity and um, exactly what we mean across all these activities that we do every day. And I'll say, if you do something like this for your working unit, whatever it is, a division or a department, you'll find it leads to a lot of really interesting conversations because much of what we do is habitual and is not questioned. And when you question everything, you wonder why you didn't do it differently. And again, I'll bring up that example of who you use, which vendors you use to order lunch. Um, I mean, it costs a division almost nothing to identify, for example, in this moment, black owned biz businesses in the community that you decide to dedicate your business to for a year when you do regular things like taking part of your budget and purchasing something that you need. Um, and really until pushed to do that by our black employee resource group, um, we didn't think of investing our money in the community like that. And yet it was such a critical and obvious part of committing to our community and showing that the, our stated values connected with the way that we behave and where we put our resources. So something small like that, I think unless we had really marched through all of our operations um, with an equity lens, I think we um, would never have identified it. But what you find are there are many opportunities to behave differently so that you are proactive um, in building an equity uh, around, um, uh, around the work that you're doing every single day. The second thing I want to talk about is rejecting our standard leadership con conventions in all kinds of organizations. Um, I think leadership is a great place to put your energy if you're thinking about focusing on one thing because you can make the best plans um, and put into place all these wonderful policies and procedures and values. But unless leadership has full buy-in, uh, it's hard for any of those things to be executed and to be sustained over time and to have the appropriate resources and investment. So I think thinking about how we diversify our leadership um, is worthwhile. And there are a lot of different ways that this can be approached. One, I think, is making our leadership structures much less vertical and hierarchical than they have been, um, because that is kind of a setup for abuses of all kinds. We know this. Um, and so thinking of more horizontal or shared leadership structures, um, also making the, the way that leadership uh, roles are allocated much more transparent, um, creating an open application process for roles, especially those that are highly paid and come with protected time for that work. Um, I think uh, there should at least be discussion around things like term limits, rotating roles, and creating succession plans. Um, there should be deliberate um, leadership development opportunities for everyone. Um, and I think we need to change our expect our default expectation about who becomes a leader uh, because there is leadership segregation and the segregation happens very early on. I mean, from the moment you start medical school, um, when you go into advanced training programs, the, there is 
explicit and implicit messages about who is naturally a leader and who would be a surprise leader. And I think people really internalize that and consider themselves not eligible for leadership, um, particularly if, you, if you're women, if, if you um, are my, minor, in a minoritized group, um, and certainly there, there's also intersectional effects. Um, and then I think we need to, uh, again, I will always say measure and track, but we need to routinely assess the equity of the leadership roles as they fall out and understand where we are in terms of our goals um, to have greater representation from the very top. So um, a lot of work to be done in terms of leadership conventions. The next thing is for equity to be everybody's role. I think of equity the same way that I think about um, in the hospital, think about patient mortality. Like we don't have an office for patient mortality because we understand that it's everybody's role to mostly keep patients alive. Um, and I think equity is an overarching goal like that. It doesn't work if you have a single equity officer and they're responsible for everything because it is too huge and embedded of a process. Um, it doesn't even make sense for 5% to do this. I think in an institution, everyone should be expected to participate in equity efforts. Everyone should take a leadership role and own something in this effort. And everyone should be held accountable um, with a concrete accountability measures. And after looking at equity efforts for a long time across many different types of institutions, I firmly believe uh, we will never make the kind of progress we want to make, at least not in this lifetime, unless the expectations are that there's universal participation in this effort. As a scientist, um, and I know you all are too, um, well, I will say that we often fail to measure and track anything when it comes to equity work. Um, we're very um, from the gut about this. We are vague when it turns um, comes to our goals. Often we have more intent than we have impact and it's because we don't attach solid outcomes and metrics to it. So I think we should treat this like, um, I really like other organizational efforts. Um, in the hospital, we're always doing things that have a million metrics attached to it. So when we have a stroke program of excellence, if I send somebody to the CAT scanner to get their brain scanned five minutes later than our target moment, I find out within two days and I'm expected to respond so that we can improve um, the systems and the protocols and the procedures so that we don't miss that metric again. And I think we should attach very specific target metrics to everything that we do in the domain of equity. Um, the community should know where we are in, in terms of reaching our stated goals. And when we fall short, um, we should have to improve iteratively and remeasure until we make our, uh, you know, make our target goals. Um, and then we should move our target goals further upstream. And the last thing is to routinize conversations. Um, I find that it's very awkward to um, in my day-to-day -day life to talk about things like um, like sex, sexual harassment, like sexism, like racism. Um, it's, it's uh, it, you mentioned the word race and people kind of tighten up. And I don't know why that is because it, it is with us all the time. I mean, structural racism is in the room with us every single day. It's just the elephant in the room. And I think the only way we get good at this is by trying and practicing as with everything else. And I think there needs to be not so much emotion attached to it, but really community-wide systems focused um, uh, solution building conversations. Again, like we do about other problems in our organizations all the time. Um, and I think we need to really train people so that they're bystander or rather they're upstander behaviors in moments where they see um, uh, uh, occurrences of sexual or uh, or racialized abuses happening. Um, we need to have this kind of knee jerk reaction to stepping in, calling it out and having a discussion around it. We're so far from this. Um, I know this can kind of seem like a pipe dream, but I put it out there because we don't get good at any of these goals unless we can talk about them. And we can't talk about them until we're comfortable talking about them. And I think there's no way around it except through. Um, through a really awkward period until it feels very natural and then we can get down to the business of fixing things. So I think I have um, used my time and I will end there and just put some questions back to you, which is, do those five things sound feasible? Can we do them? What are the barriers that you've experienced? What are some other starting points that you think are meaningful to you and, and um, seem worthwhile? I would love to discuss and I would love to take your questions and I really appreciate your attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chu. Wow, that was quite a tour de force and um, covering a lot of things many of us have been thinking about, but 
really consolidating and, and as well as um, some very new innovative data, uh, you know, the, the, the concordance findings and some of your um, leadership findings. Um, so we do have uh, several questions in the in the chat box. So I think we'll or in the Q and A box. And um, this is a moment for others to add questions if you have them, if uh, they came up. So um, and they have upvotes. So I'll start at the top. And this is um, from an anonymous uh, attendee who asks about what advice you have for female students who've experienced sexual harassment in academics. Yeah, that's a very tough question, but I think um, it is very difficult to get through this alone. So I think um, finding peer groups, finding trusted faculty, um, and also accessing the offices that are there. Um, so there will be an office that manages sexual harassment, um, whether it's with the EEOC or um, the Title IX office. And I think um, those people are there for you as a resource. Um, many schools now are starting to use some, um, you know, anonymous hotline where you can call and get advice. Um, there are also newer innovative practices. Um, there's a service called Callisto um, that is um, being deployed across universities where you can put in um, an, an instance of sexual harassment or um, uh, abuse um, anonymously and, um, and then you're notified when there's a match um, because um, often, uh, you know, uh, people tend to be uh, repetitive um, in their behaviors. And so it's very rare that a single person is the only one who has experienced um, harassment or assault from a person. There usually is going to be another one. And yet it is so much, feels so much safer to come forward with a complaint if there's another person and you just feel like you're in better company um, and then you're matched with some, some legal advice. And I think there'll be more things like that because reporting is such a barrier. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of things downstream in terms of how institutions respond to sexual harassment, but I think the biggest barrier we have is that what we see is just the tip of the iceberg. Most people fear retaliation and don't even enter into the process of seeing what is possible. So um, I think, um, uh, and, and I think it can be a very isolating and difficult process. So the, the answer is not short and it's not simple, but I think get as much support as you can, um, both from your peers and from trusted faculty, access the services that are available. They are there and they are for you. And also understand that it is extremely common um, and it has measurable health sequelae. And if it is a difficult period and you're off your game academically, and if you need counseling and you need support and you have feel unwell during that period, that is the norm. It is not you and you're not being weak and there is nothing that you did to bring that on yourself. Um, I think uh, people who are survivors of harassment and of assault tend to internalize and feel like it's something they did. And because you're isolated by definition, you have no one to counter that narrative. Um, so uh, I, I really hope that people um, feel that they can talk about it um, and find trusted people that they can share with and, and get a little balance for what can be a really difficult experience. And I'm yeah, sorry if yeah. the person asking no. that has experienced it. I'm so it's sorry. A, oh, it's a very difficult situation and just incredibly common. Last year at our uh, WISH symposium, which was dedicated to sexual harassment, we did uh, review that National Academy study. And it is remarkable that, uh, particularly in healthcare, it's it's a bigger problem than almost anywhere. Um, lots more questions. Uh, um, uh, one that uh, many people would like to hear your thoughts on. What guidance do you have for engaging colleagues who deny the existence of structural racism in medicine? Yeah, I love that question. And, and I honestly, for those of you who are in leadership positions here, I, this has to come from the top because um, this is not something that is, that is in debate. Um, you know, I think um, leadership needs to address issues like structural racism um, and present them as facts, which they are. Um, certainly, uh, it is the job of leadership to provide educational materials. It is not the job of the people experiencing the racism to educate everyone around them. Um, in fact, that's just layering on trauma on top of trauma. Um, and I think at some point, we have to move beyond um, trying to convince people and what I call admiring the problem, which is just like producing evidence upon evidence. And we just have to um, understand that like the vast majority of people 
uh, see the existence of it and move on to solutions. Because I, I think we sometimes get so stalled in convincing every last person that we never get on to solution building. Um, and so, um, you know, in clinical medicine, I mean, there may be someone who doesn't believe the existence of uh, blood clots in the law of PEs, you know, but it's like, I mean, that's bad. Um, and I'm not going to spend my time um, telling you that there are pulmonary emboli. There are, um, and you can educate yourself about that. There's plenty of literature, and then, but I need to move on and figure out how to treat patients with that disease. And I think that's at some point. And you know, I realize we're in a really steep curve in this country right now for people appreciating structural racism. And so, sure, give them some time to catch up. Um, but I think at some point we say, here are a ton of resources, go read. But those of us who have known about this all the time, and certainly people who are experiencing it every day, cannot waste their time with that. We need to move on and go further downstream on this problem. Um, another question addresses uh, sort of back to the salary inequity between men and women across healthcare. You know, it's not just physicians. Uh, I think it's a, it's sort of a mystery when you control for all these other things, when you control for <laughs> geography and hours worked and training, and we still have these gaps. Um, people are rather mystified and, you know, what what's causing that? Doesn't the position have a standard salary? Do the changes come with bargaining? You know, how, how do these come about in the first place? Yeah, salary is a multifactorial thing. And um, and I will say when people are like, well, isn't it this or that? The answer is almost always yes. It is all those things. Um, and I would say, you know, um, uh, the um, some of the fixes are, so, so first of all, I don't really believe in a standard salary. I do think we need to standardize salaries. I think by and large, um, even when people say there's a standard salary, there's no standard salary. I, I'm not sure I completely believe in that. And part of it is that when we do these studies and we uh, correct away for all these things, we're correcting away for things that are fundamentally biased. I mean, I told you that there was a lot of bias in terms of allocation of leadership roles. And yet these studies correct for leadership. They correct for rank. But achieving rank is a biased thing. So the studies that exist actually correct away for major sources of bias. And I'm not sure that we should do studies like that. I think we should actually stratify and we should acknowledge the forces that are there and not just control for them because then they're invisible. Um, so I have a, a kind of a sciency um, issue with the methodology of some of those studies, although I completely understand why they might correct for those things. Um, and I think, you know, I think so much um, has to do with job segregation and role segregation. I think so much has to do with allocation of leadership roles. I think so much has to do with um, fundamentally how we value things. I mean, if you look at the, the first salaries of people after they graduate from residency, and trust me, nothing happens in residency that means should earn $20,000 more than another, nothing. And yet, when you look at first salaries out of residency, the men are already making sixteen dollars to $20,000 more than the women. Your first job, you haven't distinguished yourself in any way. Um, and there are plenty of social science studies that show you take two resumes and you just change the gender of the first name and you ask people to estimate the appropriate salary and the men will make a bunch more. Um, so we know for sure that, this, that gender itself has a dollar value. Um, and, um, and that's what we need to address. Um, and, you know, there's almost no way to standardize it without kind of acknowledging it and tracking it and, and course correcting it in a very conscious way. Um, some of it will be collective bargaining. I do think so. Um, but for the most part, you know, um, you know, many of us will not be in kind of unionized positions. And I think, um, I think every department, every organization needs to be tracking it, be aware that the, the bias will creep in, the inequity will creep in unless we're actively looking for it and trying to counterbalance it. And part of that will be actually in the way that we allocate leadership and other roles that come with pay. Mm. Um, I, I see that um, our hour is, is up and um, the, the good news is for students in the group you you uh, will get a special session with Dr. Chu so if you're if your question was not addressed please join us in the next hour but I I need to wrap things up for our larger webinar and I see that our Dean Dr. Chatterjee has joined us she was occupied earlier uh, on cable TV, I believe, um, and I know she wanted to, to say uh, words of welcome and thank you. Uh, so I'll turn it over. Thank you very much, Lise. Uh, Dr. Chu, my sincere apologies. I, I really wanted to, to attend and I, we have the recording, so I'm hoping to hear your remarks uh, on the recording, but I 
just wanted uh, to thank you uh, personally uh, for uh, your willingness to participate in this seminar series. Um, it's, uh, it's a very important topic to us as we um, continue to work towards um, gender and other types of equity and trying to reduce bias within academic medicine and your work in the field uh, has been inspiring to all of us. So thank you for the work and thank you for um, talking to us tonight as well as to our students. Thank you so much and thank you for the work that you're doing. And I, I know why you're on cable news tonight and just really appreciate the hours that you're putting into that effort and I'm following it really closely. Mm -hmm. Well, just so the audience knows, uh, because I realize there's 100 people on there thinking, what the heck is the dean doing on cable <laughs> news? Um, I, was, I have been talking to the media actually about um, the WorkPAC meeting today on the emergency use authorization of the COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer-BioNTech. This is a critically important thing for our country and for, for the world, really. So uh, I felt that that was something that I did need to do. <laughs> Probably the most important thing that has happened all year. So thank you. We can't wait. <laughs> Neither can I. It's a big, big day. So uh, thank you both for your leadership and uh, words of wisdom. Um, I can't say goodbye without thanking our fantastic staff, uh, Nicole Ulibri and, and Jay Mode and Ray Palacios, who, who uh, ran the technical side of things. Um, I'm just going to also say farewell um, with, a, with a word about our upcoming events in the Centennial Series. We're looking forward in February to hearing from Dr. Namanje Bumpus, who's the uh, Chair of Pharmacology at Johns Hopkins and wrote a very powerful essay about racism and sexism in science. And then in March, we have Olga Anshuzuku, I'm sure I mispronounced that, Kamarda, who will be giving a, a molecular and cell sciences uh, seminar, but is uh, another wonderful role model of women in science uh, presenting at our March symposium. I also just wanted to remind um, anybody who uh, signed up for continuing education, there'll be a survey that comes around. Actually, we'd love to have survey feedback from everybody, but if you signed up for continuing education, you will need to uh, complete the survey. So uh, again, everybody, thank, uh, join me in thanking Dr. Chu. It was a really fantastic webinar. I know that many will watch the recording as well. It's so great to have you here. And um, for those of you who, who are not students, I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. And, and students, we look forward to seeing you in the breakout. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, and thank you.